Hey everybody, Chuck and Stacy here with VO Buzz Weekly. Guess what, Critical Role fans? The Dungeon Master is here, Matthew Mercer. Let's, Let's get, get buzz. Turn it up. Get ready. You're tuned in to VO Buzz Weekly. Weekly. And now, prepare to get seriously buzzed with your hosts, Chuck Duran and Stacy J. Aswan. Guys, our guest is a super talented actor you love in anime and animation, video games like Overwatch, and as the dungeon master and creator of the D&D sensation, Critical Role. We are so happy he's here, finally, and we're ready to get buzzed with the wonderful Matthew Mercer. Hi! Matthew hey Mercer! Guys. Happy to have What's me. What's up, good to buddy? See you. I'm, I'm excited to be here. So good to see you. You know, you're one of the, we were at the same agency for a while. Yeah, yeah. And you were one of the first voice actors I met at the agency. Hi Sandy, hi Peter. Yeah. Um, and it's just so fun and amazing. Congratulations on everything that's going on with you. It's just so fun to watch this, this rocket ship that you're on um, because you're, <laughs> such, you're such a hard worker. You're so talented, but you just like, you dig in and you do your work and you're such a genuinely wonderful person. So I'm just so, Thrilled for you. Thank you. So thrilled yeah, for you. me blush. He's like, hmm. no, but you know, it's like I it's kind you. of cliche. But like when wonderful people have great things happen to them, it's like you're like, yeah. yeah. It's, it's just, actually, I will say, that it's been really, really cool to, to watch a lot of friends, you know, uh, present company included, who throughout the years we all kind of converged at certain points, and then while we've all gotten busy in different realms, it's been mm -hmm. fun to watch from a distance all of us do really cool things in different circuits and be like, yeah, I'm so proud of you. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, uh, well, one um, super cool thing, um, and as fellow content creators, we understand the, <laughs> the magnitude of it, critical role. Yeah, that's... Dude, congratulations. <laughs> Thank I mean, you. Tell us all the juicy what's the whys. Where did what made you say I'm gonna yeah. do this? It, How does somebody create something? Leave like nothing that? out. Or why? Uh, uh, well, uh, <laughs> I'll I'll give you all the really juicy, yeah. dark stories of its inception. Um, I grew up playing a lot of Dungeons and Dragons, and uh, I'm a huge nerd, and I love make believe. So I've been playing it most of my life, mm. and uh, I had an opportunity to convince Liam O'Brien, who I was working with a video game many years ago, uh, so that if he ever was interested in getting back into it, because he mentioned that he played it as a kid and loved it, but it was too busy. I was like, mm. if you ever want to play again, like, let me know, I'll be happy to run you a game. And so eventually he gave in. Uh, so it was a birthday present, I, I ran a one-time game for him, and we invited a bunch of the voice actor friends with us who never played for the most part. And uh, we had a good time one night. We all just drank and rolled dice, and were huge geeks, and it was great. But we started playing more and more. We had, everyone right. kind of got hooked, and so we turned it into a campaign, and we played privately for two years. And really? Yeah, mm -hmm. just just for fun. And it was like a club. That's an, usually an underground how, yes. club. Cub, cult, you could say. <laughs> <A cult>. uh, <laughs> four letters starts with a C. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, we uh, we we just played for our fun. And uh, Ashley Johnson, one of our players, had uh, been working on a project with Felicia Day, and it came up in conversation. And Felicia basically said, "Well, why, why don't you?" Do this online, like on a camera, and so Felicia brought me in. We did a, like a meeting and discussion on it, and I was a bit apprehensive because I was afraid that if you put something that's this nerdy, you know, considered in a large scale yeah. uh, socially, and something that I love very much on the internet like that, is a good chance people are just going to light it on fire, stab it till it's dead. And so mm -hmm. eventually, we we convinced ourselves that you know what, let's give it a shot. If it doesn't it doesn't work, it doesn't work. We take it back home, and we're fine. Right. And uh, strangely, it, it found an audience, and that audience grew. So worked. And now, now we're three years later, and it's just a surreal experience, so. Yeah. That's yeah. so cool, man. Is it, is it what you thought it would be? No, it's so much more than <laughs> it would be. Literally, we, yeah. we, we, we took it as an excuse to play more often. Because back mm -hmm. then, when you're all adults, especially like Liam and Sam who have kids, and now Laura and Travis who are having a kid, which is right. crazy, um, we could only really organize a day to play once every six to eight weeks. And now we get to play weekly, and that was mm -hmm. kind of the big draw initially. It was like, well, technically it's work, so we right. can do it every week. It's yeah. character research. Exactly. Yes. Uh, so, so yeah, we had no idea it was gonna become what it is today, and now we have like a comic book with Dark Horse that's doing really well. We're developing other cool ancillary possibilities. We just announced today that uh, our characters from Critical Role are going to be appearing in the next Pillars of Eternity video game. Wow, that's awesome. Um, which we all got to voice, and yeah. it's it's just weird to have these things that we created, these characters and these stories and these worlds that we created ourselves, 
and now get to perform them and bring them into other forms of media. As That's actors, cool, as mm -hmm. you know, yeah. you know, we're we're an instrument of the storytelling engine, but usually we're just the part that you know, translates and delivers the story that was somebody else's idea, somebody else yeah. was directing, somebody else was producing it. This is something that's wholly ours, and yeah. being able to watch it expand has been a really surreal and wonderful thing. That's really cool, yeah. man. Well, how I does, mean, uh, how does somebody wa uh, watch or listen? Where do they go? Uh, you can go to, uh, we, we play live every, mostly every Thursday at 7 p.m. Pacific on Twitch mm -hmm. uh, uh, for, under Geek and Sundry. You go to the Geek and Sundry Twitch page at 7, and we'll be there. Uh, otherwise, we upload the episodes to YouTube the following Monday. Okay. Yeah. Um, and podcasts. We have just audio only podcasts if you only have time to listen in your car. Yes. Uh, and the YouTube channel is at? Uh, the YouTube channel is Geek and Sundry, Geek and Sundry. is the YouTube. Cool. You can Same just search thing, Critical but, Role. And, yeah, and mm -hmm. podcasts on if, just everywhere. Pretty basically. much anywhere you can find a podcast, yeah. just search Critical Role and you'll find the backlog of yeah. episodes. So. Mm -hmm. cool. so, I mean, you obviously have the writing, directing, producing chops. So, um, what. How interactive is the the campaign, or are you basically giving everybody their roles? Uh, well, so, so how for those who aren't familiar with role playing games, uh, all the players created their characters. Um, mm -hmm. They chose from the the game system we're playing, which for Dungeons and Dragons is you know I'm I'm an elf, I'm a I'm a dwarf, I'm an, I'm a half orc, I'm a human, I'm a halfling, I'm a gnome. You know they have these different yeah. archetypes they can choose from, and then they choose their character class, which can be like a fighter or a wizard or the multitudes of variations in between, then they create their character's personality, their backstory, their their personality traits, their flaws, their bonds, their goals in life, and then I run the game as the dungeon master, which means I build the world, I perform all the characters that populate it, and they may encounter, I describe the scenes they're in, uh, describe the, the temperature of the air around them when they walk into a dank dungeon, or uh, the heat of the you know the the bleeding sky as you're trying to trek across a large open vast desert, um, and it's just all, us as friends improvising. It's just we have some systems. The dice are there to see if you want to try and achieve something that's difficult. If you succeed or fail, right. and based on if they succeed or fail at what they're trying to do, the story changes left or right. And so it's this very organic. Collaborative storytelling yeah, experience. What a yeah. blast! Man. It's a I lot mean, of how, fun, man. I'm oh, telling it's you. so fun, and you're so, uh, you're so engaging to watch, um, and everyone is, and it's so fun to see, like you know, all of our mutual friends and people that clearly haven't been in that world, mm -hmm. and just how you know they just go for it, which is so fun. But I mean, when you were doing D and D, I was putting my hair in a bun and tying up point shoes. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I obviously know about it. But um, how is it now? Um, growing as a grown up, gr more grown, um, playing <laughs> yeah. it. Never really full grown. <laughs> no, you're to be 22. Fair. You're, uh, you're maybe taller. That? As you're taller. <laughs> We're never all fully grown, thank goodness. But mm -hmm. how is it differing for you from when you played D&D &D as a kid? Well, for one thing, it's, it's become, especially in recent years, much less stigmatized. Yes. Like when I grew up, you didn't mention that you played D&D. &D. Yes. You know, it was like a very, like, it was a very <laughs> subculture. The underground. Yeah, because kids got beat up for it. There was the satanic panic of the 80s where people thought it was, you know, yeah. the yeah. devil was getting in yes. you through the game. And so it just had all this misunderstanding in, in, in media. So it was, for me, it's really exciting to have something I've always been passionate about be something we can be open with. And, and people are genuinely on a, on a large social scale interested to learn about it now yeah. or get involved. Right, right. People who never would have thought about it are now starting their own games, and it's, yeah. it's been really fun. That's well, really and how cool. wonderful that, especially when you go to, you know, when you make your appearances and go to conventions, that how wonderful that there's this whole population of people that feel accepted and feel embraced because you all share this. It's it's, it's incredible. It must feel really great, right? It's really amazing. The community that's built around it has just blown me away. Um, we get to meet all these wonderful people at events and conventions and how it's changed their life, mm -hmm. strangely, but also how it's changing ours progressively, yeah. too. Yeah. And like, me as a voice actor, I got into most of the character archetypes and voices that I know today that I use for my career. Mm -hmm. I learned running Dungeons and Dragons as a teenager because as a dungeon master, you have to do all these characters, all these different voices. Right. Yeah. So that's yeah. where I've kind of established my toolbox. It's like an improv an improvised one man show every week. Pretty much. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, with you and your friends. One thing, you know, when I was watching a lot of different um, uh, episodes. You guys go deep sometimes, and you really address some of the things that are happening in in pop culture within the game. Is that something that um, you guys are really cognizant of beforehand, or it's just when you're in that world, it just kind of unfolds? 
It's more the latter. I mean, other than the game that I'm planning, so much is happening in the moment that we don't we don't talk ahead of time about what's going to happen. You know, we're, right. we, we're all there showing up, and what's happening is organic. So. A lot of the times, what transpires is either because I wanted to touch on a certain subject that has social mirrors to what's happening in the real world because that's something we can all identify with yeah. and kind of work through in a way as part of the story, or conversely, it's something that's kind of simmering under the edge for the players yeah. and comes out naturally. Mm. So uh, it's it's not intended sometimes to become this the centerpiece thing, but that's kind of what's so wonderful about the experience is it yeah. organically finds itself there in the center and then we all tackle it like a bunch of nerdy theater kids do <laughs> and, and, and see where it takes us. Yeah, well, and it's nice and everyone feels safe and people watching, you know, because there is that fantasy element, but then you can kind of feel safe to, to go there. Yeah. And well, you guys do go to some pretty... We do. There's yeah. a lot, there's, there's a, an awful lot of video content on the internet now of me crying and oh. I'm okay with it. We like a good cry. We cry. We cry all the time. I, I might cry, cry every day at I four might cry in a couple Pacific. of minutes here. Um, <laughs> hey, can I? I'm going to switch. It your eyeballs. It's yeah, very, I'm going to switch things easy. around a little bit here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, can we talk about Before your role? Before we make Maddie cry. Okay. Your role as uh, McCree in Overwatch. Uh, yes. I mean, this is freaking huge, man. <sighs> What's it like being a part of this gigantic franchise? It's it's crazy. I, I grew up with Blizzard. Like, I, I played mm -hmm. all of their games. And yeah. so, um, to be able Are to you just the... saying that because they give you money? <laughs> no, no, man. Okay, I, I, right. I played I the just... crap out of the first couple Warcraft games, Starcraft. I, I, I was you there. You don't have to prove it. It's okay. Oh, I will we prove it. Look, it. I know that there's a nerd Matt, community I was out there. Messing with We're now going to pan to the footage of Matt's house where he has <laughs> the <laughs> games laid out. Yeah, I know it's true. Like I, I played World of Warcraft forever, forever. Lost many years to that game. Um, so to, to work with them at all has been huge. But Overwatch was one of those things that when they first revealed. The game you saw it was going to be something special. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The first cinematics, and so I was like, I really want to be part of this. And when I got the role uh, and being able to work with with Andrea Toyas and the fantastic team with Overwatch, it's just been a really invigorating experience. This game that has a an optimistic, futuristic look at the modern day and a multicultural uh, unity uh, that mm -hmm. I think a lot of games don't really handle yeah. as well as Overwatch does. So everybody, no matter where they are in the world, can find a character they identify with yeah. at any age and be like, I. I like that character, I feel like that character, I want to be yeah. like that character. And that's that type, the type of hero uh, mentality that not a lot of media gets right. And the tone is just so perfect with Overwatch. So to, so to, to play McCree in this and see the community be so accepting and so excited for my small contribution to it yeah. is humbling, it's exciting, um, and... Uh, and I get to be a, a laid-back cowboy. Drink too bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we just go, how did you He's get to He's kind of like a cooler Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> kind of, yeah. A little, <laughs> little less bongo nudity, yeah. but uh, yeah. just a little. You don't have your shirt off as much. How yes, did you either. get that role? Uh, an audition came through, and uh, the name was different. They didn't say what game it was for, mm. any of the information, but they had the character art, and I remembered seeing it at BlizzCon that year uh -huh. in the little art booth. I was like, oh, I know what this is. I know what this is. So I just I worked really hard on the audition. I uh, I I was hoping it would go through. I had a booth director at the time that kind of steered me off where I wanted to go, but so by I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah. by saying you worked really hard in the audition, what does that entail? Meaning I just made sure that I I went through multiple times reading and listening back to my audition, making tweaks where I felt it needed to be. Uh, I had so much preparation involved in them, and I went in my booth director shot it all down on my preparation mm. and was like, no, 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 more like this, more like this. And I should have gone with my instinct. Um, and then I didn't get a callback. Or, I, or they didn't, I, I wasn't part of the callbacks. Uh, Andrea Toya's Blizzard, who I'd worked with before, had faith in my ability and told the team, like, at least get Bring Matt him, on the callback. Yeah. Bring him in again. I know he can give you what you want. And I owe her forever mm. for this, if you're watching, Andrea. Um, <laughs> They, they they slipped me into the into the callbacks and uh, the team seemed to like what I had to bring yeah. and went back so and forth. So on the callback, did you go with more with what you were feeling in your gut before? Yeah, originally? yeah, yeah. Because because I wanted to be a little more, I don't say playful, but uh, when you think cowboy, you think Clint Eastwood. Yeah, which is all like down here, very 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 gritty in one note. Right. And that was what I was kind of pushed into in the audition. And I wanted to be a little more personality, a little more laid back, a little yeah, more, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure, whiskey, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so I got to do a little more of that in the callback, and uh, it seemed to work out, and so it's so been great. So the moral of the story is? 
Go with your instincts. Go with your instincts, people. Yeah. yeah. Especially if you know but, what you're doing. Well, I know. <laughs> but isn't it funny how, like, you know, like, there's, it's like the little voices in your head are going, do it this way. Yeah. And, you, like, you just know. I mean, and that's such a great lesson that even if someone's saying, you know, and obviously if you're in the gig and the, the director's saying do it this, yes. But for auditions... Because we don't know yeah. all the variables. Yeah. You're working in a void. You're given so yeah. little information to work with that you can only really trust your instincts. And and it's okay if you're not certain and the director has a direction that you can glomp on. That's great. Yeah. yeah. But if you have a very solid, confident idea of what you want this this audition to be and you're directed away from it, yeah. like, stand would you up consider, for yourself, man. Yeah. Would you consider yeah. yourself a good self-director on most of the audition stuff you do from home, probably? I do, yeah. I, I consider myself a decent self-director. There are certain projects, if they're really important to me, and I really want to knock it out of the park, that I will insist on having a director in the booth because I want that second year. Mm -hmm. right. I want somebody to, to find the things that I'm not noticing. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah, as, as, as experienced as you may be <laughs> as, as a performer, there's always... Always room for improvement. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's your like? What's your your your? your what, am I, what word am I looking for? What's you? What? How do you approach your auditions at home? Let's say it's nothing that you really want to bring in another right, right. Uh, director or anything. So you look at. And let's say, do you also do stuff for commercial or only video games and... I audition for commercial. I don't book it very often. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then let's stick with the stuff that you do book, okay? Maybe it's animation. That's maybe it's change. video game, we, right? We right. You got it. You got specs. Maybe you got a picture. Maybe you don't. How do you tear it apart and, and, and give a good audition? What uh, you feel is? I, I feel uh, filling, in, filling in the blanks. It's very easy to look at the line, the, the, the very simple breakdown you're given. You know, they're yeah. 25 to 35... Uh, you know, white bread mid America likes dogs, and that's all you have to go on. If you don't step beyond that breakdown, your performance is going to be almost as amorphous. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's all right. It says he's white bread. Has he always been in middle America? Did he move here before? Has his family life been positive, or has he dealt with like an abusive parent? Um, you know, is he optimistic? Is he pessimistic about life? Is he trying to pull himself out of a hole? You, as an actor, have to kind of build a character out of the very disparate pieces you're yeah. given. Yeah. So I spend a lot of time kind of fleshing out the personality of this character that, that they've sort of given you a part to, practicing it, going through the dialogue and the sides, and finding beats and nuances there. I think a lot of people, especially if you're new to voiceover or, um, or trying to, to be competitive in it, it's very easy to look at a line of dialogue and just read it through. Yeah. It's a very comfortable, like, read it through. Yeah. Maybe a couple of pauses here and there. I find creating a space in your mind where the character is living and walking and interacting mm -hmm. yeah. and giving some physicality to it really helps it come to life. It's the right. difference between reading a line that might say, hey, look, I know you're here for help, but I'm sorry, I just don't have any time. Or going, look, I know you're here for some help, but I, I just don't have any time. You add that physicality to it. Right. Anyone listening to it, casting director or otherwise, imagines a scene. They imagine a character walking, grabbing a chair, sitting down, mm -hmm. right. grabbing a drink, you know? Right. And so for me, it's building the character, building a scene in my head where I think the character is living, and then giving it a few shots until I'm happy. Yeah, and, and that's good yeah. because even yeah. if it's not the right scene, it is a scene. Yeah. And like you There's said, layers. the casting director yeah. is going to listen and they're going to feel something from it mm -hmm. rather than just hearing words. Yeah. And even character. if you're not right for the character you're auditioning, yeah. if they like what you've done, they'll hold on to that and they'll bring you in maybe for something else that better fits for you. For example, like an Overwatch callback. Yeah. Like an Overwatch. It's a per <laughs> perfect example. A perfect example <laughs> of, of a person Cookie, remembering how that me. Works. See? Hmm. See? Hey, Matt. Hey. I have a question for you, buddy. What's your question? So, dude, have you always wanted to be an actor? Like, ever since you were a little kid, is that something that, that was a passion? Or when did you figure out, I want to do, I want to be an actor? It wasn't. Uh, I wanted to be an artist for most of my life. A I, painter? Uh, illustration. Right. Uh, I'll be perfectly honest, like, creature illustration. I've always, mm. I have sketchbooks of all my years growing up of just monsters and animals and demons. I just loved uh, those type of, of, of design challenges. So. Yeah. Uh, my whole life I was gearing up to go into 2D and 3D animation illustration. And I, I was around high school, that uh, my, my freshman year of high school, right when I got into D&D, &D, uh, my theater teacher at the time, who wasn't my, well, he wasn't my theater teacher at the time, but he became him, yeah. Mr. K, saw me sketching after school one day and sat down and started talking to me for a bit. And after some conversation, he's like, hey, uh, why don't you audition for this play? We're doing uh, here, uh, having auditions next week. And I was like, I, I don't really, don't do the theater 
thing. He's like, just give it a shot. Just try it out. See if you like it. I'm like, all right, fine. And so I went and auditioned. Boy, uh, he's easy to talk into. <laughs> well, it's a longer yeah. conversation okay, I was going to say, that took about a minute, man. Chuck, he, Matt is open. No. okay. He's open. So this took three weeks for yeah, him yeah, to talk he, you into it? Yeah, he was stalking me. It was really uncomfortable. <laughs> um, but but I, ended up, I ended up uh, booking uh, Reverend Hale in The Crucible. It was my Ooh, first experience wow. on stage, and I was that's like, "That's quite a, a role." I think it's like decent middle-sized role. Yeah. It wasn't too bad, um, and it, it bug bit me, man. I started mm. doing more theater after that, and I got involved in more musical theater. And from that point, I, I didn't think I'd pursue acting. I'd grown up around actors, and the, right. the, the line everyone always told me was, "Don't be an actor. No matter what you do in this town, <laughs> don't, don't be, be an actor." And I was like, "Totally get it. No worries. Not going to happen." Yeah, it didn't stick. Mm. Uh, so yeah, that that it. It wasn't an intent, it just became something that through the years I, I teetered with, and as time went on, I got more opportunities and more little bites here and there, and eventually, back in like 2007, I said, you know what, I don't want to live with the regret of not really trying this, yeah. like whole hog. So I quit my job, I saved up some money, and I figured I'd just hit it as hard as I can, and if it didn't work, at least I know I tried and I can move on to the next venture. Yeah. And uh, still going strong. Yeah. And look at him now, Yay. fancy pants. <laughs> um, I have heard you Well, hold say, on, oh. because this, because, so, so what was a trans, <laughs> what was a transition this between stage special. and acting into voice acting? Uh, it's a combination of me being a huge nerd and growing up playing video games and cartoons and going, right. I could maybe do that. You know, I, I, um, I was very self-conscious in the sense of like, I know I couldn't be an on-camera actor, and the few times, the while that I did try for on-camera acting, it was either, all right, you're cast as the, the IT guy or the drug dealer. Oh. And that was consistently all really? I ever got, because I was a long-haired, skinny guy at the time. Yeah. Um, so I, I just wasn't enjoying on-camera. Theater was so much fun, even though it wasn't really a money-making experience right. for me. And voiceover fit in the realm of nerd stuff that I really felt passionate about. So I was like, let me try that. Um, I had some small opportunities to meet some people that were in my early days in the industry that kind of got me in the door to yeah. do my first Wallace session yeah. uh, and, and do some small bits here and there. And I was like, you know what? I could see this being a thing. So that, that path kind of clicked in. Yeah. And honestly, I think the theater skill set lends better to voiceover than the on-camera skill set because yeah. it teaches you to live in a space with minimal uh, you know, outer, uh, I was sort of looking for, Inspiration, you don't have costumes or a set piece to work with. Mm -hmm. It's just your imagination and mm -hmm. you're by yourself in front of a room. And so a lot of black box theater helped prepare me for that. Yeah. Um, being so conscious of my voice, being conscious of breathing, mm -hmm. being conscious of volume. Uh, so many elements of theater help prepare me for voiceover, I think, than any other sort of acting training could have. So that's yeah. cool. Man. Yeah, and there's no take two. Do and there's definitely no take have two. To take <laughs> Do you remember yeah. the moment? I'm sorry, now I'm hogging That's him. okay. <laughs> Do you remember the moment? I'll hog him back. Do you remember the moment? Voiceover, in respect to voiceover, that you were like, oh my God, I, this is it. This is what I'm going to be doing for the rest of my freaking life. This is what I want to be doing. I think I do. Um, it was. It would have been 2000, 2001, 2002? Yeah. I had I had this this wonderful guy named Joe Ramirez, who had been working at a company called Magnitude 8 that did Japanese anime Yeah. Um, back in those early days had me in to do a one-off character in a series called Fist of the North Star, which is a Japanese anime that I was a fan of mm. when I was much younger. And so I got to step into the role of a character that I already was aware of and got to portray that in this space. And to me, it was just this surreal, nerd full circle for me that, that fulfilled me in a way I wasn't expecting. And that was the first little bite I really had that went, this, this is something I can get used to doing with my, with my own time. Yeah. And then I worked on a video game called Scaler for the PS2 about a year or two years after that. It was my first lead project in, a, in any sort of anything ever. Yeah. And I got to be this like, you know, kind of young character named Scaler who was a boy turning into a chameleon, but then he like turned into other creatures and stuff. And it was fun. He had kind of an attitude. It was really kind of like, kind of a 90s-ish yeah. mm -hmm. you know, mascot character yeah. for like, hey yeah. kids, recycle. You know, it was su yeah. super cheesy. Yeah. <laughs> but it was but it was a lot of fun. Guy. Yeah, it was straight up. Totally. But it yeah. was so much fun and, and intoxicating to be in that space and being able to create this character myself without any real uh, influence beyond just the producer working with me to find the character. I was like, oh my God, I own this character. Mm -hmm. It is something yeah. I, that came from me and other people get to enjoy it. And as cheesy as it may have been at times, it, 
I realized then that this, if this was an option for me to, for the rest of my life, I'm gonna grab it with both yes. hands. Good for you. Yes, I love it. Uh, well, that's all we got for part one with Matt Mercer, and wow, is he cool. He is the best. Yeah, Such absolutely. A great guy. We're gonna be back next week with part two. We will. In the meantime, keep up with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks for subscribing and leaving your comments below. We love you guys, and just remember, you, you always, always have, have time, time for a little buzz. buzz. Buzz Weekly is sponsored by Chuck Duran's Demo That Rock. Rock. The voiceover demo producer to the stars is now available to you. Visit DemosThatRock.com and take your voiceover career to the next level. See you next time. And remember, you always have time for a little buzz.